We're very pleased to have James Gorman here. He's the chairman and CEO of Morgan Stanley. Uh, Mr. Gorman has held that position as chairman and CEO since 2012. He became the CEO in 2010. And prior to that, he ran the global wealth management business of Morgan, Stan Morgan Stanley. He came to Morgan Stanley in 2006, and he came there from Merrill Lynch, where he ran their global private client business. Uh, prior to being at Merrill Lynch, he was for 12 years at McKinsey, where he was a senior partner and oversaw uh, their financial services practice and was recruited to Merrill Lynch by the CEO of Merrill Lynch. Prior to uh, being a partner at McKinsey, he had been at Columbia Business School, which he went to after he had been a lawyer. He is a native of Australia, grew up there, got his undergraduate degree at University of Melbourne and his law degree, practiced for four years in uh, Australia, and then went to Columbia Business School and then started this ascent up of uh, the financial service world. Morgan Stanley is, of course, one of the best known financial service uh, organizations in the world. It has a market cap today of about $57 billion, has about 55,000 employees, and has annual revenue of about $33 billion. So very impressive. Um, thank you very much for coming here today. So let me just ask you two questions at the outset before we talk about Morgan Stanley, a bit about your background. Um, you are um, known as James Gorman, not Jim Gorman. Most people have named James, they use Jim, but you're famous for being James Gorman. So what is the reason for that? Well, firstly, delighted to be back in Washington. Thank you. And uh, with the Economic Club, David, thank you for having me. It's a great honor. Um, and I have to say before I answer that tricky question, um, that hearing my resume, it feels a bit like I can't keep a job. <laughs> they just keep going and going. Well, that's uh, all the, the right way. So, uh, well, they're very but kind. But you're trying to elude the question of why you <laughs> use the name James, right? Well, no, I was still on my talk about Washington. I didn't want to get off that. No, I, it's that's a pretty funny story. It was one of these moments which uh, journalists will appreciate. We jokingly said in a meeting about 15 years ago in front of a journalist, um, one of my colleagues said he doesn't want to be called Jim, call him James. And it's actually uh, partly true. And the reason is I'm one of originally 12 children. And my mother, who is uh, 89, uh, always wanted to be called James. So as all of you know, you do what your mother says. Okay. So I am not going to cross that one. OK. Well, by the way, uh, when you grow up, I'm an only child. So I didn't have the experience you did. But what is it like to have 12 children in a family, 10 of them are still alive today? Um, you know, is it like dealing with Wall Street? Uh, people want higher salaries when they keep coming to you? Is it, you know, dealing with children like that many brothers and sisters? What is that like? Well, firstly, it's ongoing. Um, okay. We never grow up. In fact, I had some email exchanges with two of my brothers last night. Um, you know, we, we uh, my dad is 91. Uh, the parents both live. And um, we always sat around the table together every night. And the deal was that you had to say something of interest that happened that day. And if it was about you, that generally was considered not very interesting. <laughs> so you were forced to think. And in the early days, my sister, um, uh, elder sister, who is a wonderful person, very brilliant, and one of the top judges in Australia, was in the peace marches around the time of the the Vietnam War, and at the same time that she was a young university student, at the same time the youngest member of our table was my uh, little brother who was a kindergarten. So we had to, you had to have sufficient social antennae that you could keep that crowd interested. And uh, so I think it, it was always um, entertaining and you were forced to relate to people who were um, at times very difficult and, and often very different from you. So it was, it's actually a bit like what I do today. They're all children I work with, you know. But, but, when you, but when you go back to Australia now, you're running one of the biggest companies in the financial service world. You're a big deal on Wall Street um, and everywhere in the business community. When you go back and you have your nine siblings, uh, do they treat you like you're a big deal or they just ask you to just not talk that much? Well, the, the, the usual, um, is I turn up and usually they'll hold a barbecue at one of my brothers or sisters' homes and everybody will gather, which for us a family lunch, actually it's a bit like this room. It's <laughs> I have 32 nieces and nephews and so we have something like 
I think there are 71 of us all together, my immediate family. And as you walk through the gate, um, yeah, it's, we cater lunches. Um, <laughs> as you walk through the gate, invariably one of my brother in brothers or brother-in-laws will call out, oh, you know, here's Jim, because they want to yeah. give me a hard time. And um, where'd you park your jet on the front lawn? Right. You know, <laughs> and it just goes downhill from Thank there. You. So, so um, you know, it's very unusual for somebody that came out of a consulting background and also let's say not American, to rise up to run one of the large uh, Wall Street firms. So you have an unusual background. You're Australian, and you were a consultant by trade before you got into Wall Street. So is it an advantage or disadvantage to not having come out of the investment banking or trading business in running Morgan Stanley? Well, there have been so many great leaders that have come out of the investment banking business, um, you know, at, at a lot of the firms that I don't, I don't, it's certainly not necessary to have a different experience. I think in this time right now, having seen so many different cultures and businesses, uh, is, it's certainly been helpful to me. And, uh, you know, the, de the deficit is I never traded um, a stock and the financial advisors will always criticize me and say you never dropped a ticket. So one time in a group like this with about 400 of our financial advisors. I got on the stage and I took a piece of paper, I dropped it on the ground, and I said, so I've now done it. Can we move on? Right. You know. Well, so um, you can say, in other words, it's not a big disadvantage. You obviously have a, uh, a very good mind and you've got a, a very good track record in the consulting area and obviously in the global wealth management business. Um, when you're managing traders and investment bankers, though, do they have bigger egos than you usually deal with in the consulting world or is it harder to manage them or it's not that difficult? Well, you haven't met my full family, so. Okay, so you're used to <laughs> no, they're, they're, you know, they're, you've just got to figure, it's like any business. I mean, it's, it's, it's what you do in managing very talented people. You have to understand what motivates them and, and respect what motivates them, but at the same time, let them know that we're, if you're on our team, you're on our team. You're not, you're not an individual, you're, on, you're part of the team and you're going to play by the rules of the team and we'll celebrate what you're really good at, what you bring to the team, but you've also got to respect what everybody else is good at. And for some folks that they don't like that constraint, they, you know, they want to be their own boss, and I respect that. But if you want to work at, at these public companies, that's your, you know, you're owned by shareholders, you have boards and governance structures, and, and you've got, you got to play as part of the team. Now, you are seen in Wall Street as trying to delever the risk profile of, uh, and, and reduce the risk profile of Morgan Stanley and, and maybe get less money out of proprietary trading and more out of asset management. And how, what was the reasoning behind that? And are you happy with the uh, change you've made in Morgan Stanley towards that end? Well, it's, it's, um, that's a sort of the, a very important question, getting at kind of what we've done with our firm. Um, we, you know, the, firstly, the, the world changed. And I, I think, you, you know, I'm, I'm very pragmatic about the reality of what you're dealing with. We could all wish the world were different, but it ain't different. It's what it is today. And you've got to adjust to that. And the regulators, I think, um, generally have done a very good job in forcing institutions that want to carry enormous risk and are systemically important to support that risk with lots of capital and lots of liquidity, which is very expensive. And uh, as a result, um, you have to look at yourself as an institution and say, what are we really good at? And could we generate the same kinds of returns with much more capital and much more liquidity than we had in the good old days when um, obviously it was, it was uh, much more levered industry? And we at Morgan Stanley have prided ourselves for you know, nearly 80 years um, on being an institution that provides world-class advice. There's sort of an intellectual capital at the heart of the DNA. And advice is not to ourselves, it's to others. So if you put the advice and the client together, that tells you what your DNA is. So we, we shut down all of the proprietary stuff because A, we weren't very good at it, and B, it just wasn't part of our DNA, and it wasn't where the regulatory world has moved. And we doubled up on the things that we think we're much better at, which is giving advice, whether it's to individual investors or in M&A transactions uh, or, or the like. And I think that, that shift of an institution has made us safer a little um, less flashy, um, but with enormous ballast for the, for the tough times. And I think as an investment proposition or employee proposition or a client proposition, 
just a more stable institution, and, and I think that's a good outcome. Well, the market seems to have liked what you've done so far. Your stock is up about 55% this year. Your market cap, as I mentioned earlier, is about, I think, 37, uh, I'm 57. sorry, $57 billion, but at the peak it was $90 billion. So do you have a realistic goal to get it back to $90 billion, or is that just too far in the future? Well, I wouldn't want to share with everybody here <laughs> where we're going <laughs> to... Just a few of you can come in the back room and we'll take... But no, the funny thing was, you know, in, in the year 2000, our, th this industry, I don't, most of you folks probably know, know the industry very well and, and shouldn't, but the industry generally traded between one and a half times book. If stocks traded below that, they were cheap, and above two and a half times, they were expensive. And for a long time, it traded along that, maybe one and a quarter to two and a quarter, but that kind of range. And um, there have been two periods of anomaly in the last, you know, many, many decades. One was in 2000, where we, as an example, traded at six times book. And everybody thought, because we were leading a lot of internet underwritings, we were an internet company. They got confused. We're like the bank doing the underwriting. We're not the company. And we traded at six times book. And that's when the market cap was, stock was over $100, market cap was 90, 90 billion. Um, that was nuts. We should never, you should never be trading at six times book. And, um, 12 months ago, uh, we were trading at about 0.4 book. And that was equally nuts. They were both, they were both as crazy as each other. And uh, now today we're trading at about book value, so I would argue we're still cheap, but it's, you know, the, the world has been through a difficult crisis. So, you know, as we normalize and, and as I believe our strategy plays out, I'm, I'm very confident we'll return to those kinds of market cap levels. Now, you mentioned internet uh, and tech company. You have been a leader in uh, underwriting a lot of tech companies, the internet. Uh, Mary Meeker, when she was with you and others, led that effort. Um, and you famously led the Facebook IPO. And some people thought that was too highly priced. The price is now above where it was at the IPO. Would you like to comment on how the Facebook IPO occurred and whether you're satisfied with the result? Well, I think the, the most important thing about the Facebook IPO is um, not the IPO, it's the Facebook part. Uh, this is a great American success story. And this is the kind of thing that has made this country extraordinary. And the level of innovation, uh, of creativity, and then the financial support to bring what was an idea in a dorm room um, to be a $80 billion company with billions of people following it and logging on every day, as I'm sure all of you are. It's just extraordinary. So the IPO I regard as kind of a, an event in this extraordinary company, and it was disappointing to me during the whole IPO process. There wasn't more of a celebration of what that management team had done and what they had created in terms of vibrancy for the economy and the competitive instinct for everybody else in the Valley to come up with other ideas and be the next Facebook. So, that, so that's just sort of my editorial on the side. Um, the actual IPO, I mean, it was a mess. The market opening was a mess. It was, it was something that was completely unprecedented, the hype going into it. And um, the, you know, pricing that stock, you price it based upon what the observable demand for the stock is. You have a seller, let's say you have somebody selling their house and you have two buyers coming along, they'll say, we'll give you $500,000. One of them says, the other says $520,000. And you're advising the house seller, you'd probably tell them to take whichever you thought had the best chance of closing because they're close enough. You wouldn't come in and say, you know, I've got another buyer for $200,000, why don't we do that? The owners would say, get out of here. So there's a balance. That's what markets are, and you try and find the market. And when we had that mess of the opening, I said publicly uh, on CNBC, who are uh, covering us a lot about it, um, that I felt a little patience was called for. And give it a year. And let's in a year judge whether this really was what everybody had said it was. And um, it took 15 months, didn't take a year. So we're off by a little bit, but it's trading up 15% and it remains a great American success story. So there are two uh, quotes that you are well known for in Wall Street. Let me see if I can get them more or less right. That you said to people in Morgan Stanley who thought they were not paid enough if they didn't, weren't happy with their compensation, they could go elsewhere because they were too highly paid and they were taking too much risk. Is that more or less right? And your view is that Wall Street people were too highly paid at some point? No. Okay. <laughs> is anybody too highly paid? Well, I won't go into that. Um, no, I, the, the, 
the, if you think of a spectrum of, of compensation, there's sort of the, um, uh, you know, there, there are the very greedy people who want to be maximized personal comp at, at the shortest possible time period. Then uh, you've got the economic rationalists who figure that uh, you've got to compensate yourself as well as the owners of the business. Then you've got the people who uh, feel like there's just a maximum amount of compensation people should get paid. There's kind of a, a moral sense. And, and then there are other, other folks who I guess just don't agree with the capitalist model and everybody gets paid the same. You know, I'm clearly in the economic rationalist bucket, which was pretty simple. If somebody gives you their capital to use and you don't give them a return on it, but you keep paying yourself as though you did, at some point, the person who gave you the capital picks up their money and goes home, goes like picking up your bat and ball and they leave and, they, and you don't have a business. So what I said to our folks was, just like we had to be patient on the previous conversation, I said, um, let's deliver a return for our owners and worry about paying ourselves once we've done that. And if we get that in reverse order, which Wall Street has done from time to time, you get very frustrated investors and the stocks trade very poorly. So we have deferred the sort of self-gratification to improve the performance of the company, make the investments we needed to make. And then as the company improves and shareholders are rewarded, the owners are rewarded, uh, we should definitely be rewarded. I have no, there's no upside to what people can be paid if they perform well. Nobody's telling the owners of these new IPOs they can't get the money from the IPO. Uh, it's the same in any business. So it's really a sense of just balance between a shareholder gives you money and they expect a return, we better give them a return. So you're not having people leave you because they're not highly paid enough, more or less, and you're not having a hard time recruiting people? I mean, our, our campus recruiting numbers, I don't have the exact numbers, David, but I think we had something like 88% acceptance of college kids this year. And, you know, we get, I talk to these kids all the time going up and down the elevators, and, and you know, they're as smart as whips, and we, we have no problem. I think we had 100,000 resumes last year. You know, we get, we get a lot of talent coming through the door. So I'm not worried about that. In terms of the senior people, no, we've had, we've had a great team. The, most of my management committee are uh, Morgan Stanley veterans of 20 plus years. I'm very proud of that. I'm kind of the new kid on the block. Well, the other quote that you were famous for or well known for is you said something along the lines that you didn't expect that the type of financial crisis we experienced in 2007 or 8 would recur again in our lifetime. And would you still stay in with that statement, or do you think that was a little bit too broad? Well, I, I, um, it doesn't really matter, because I can't take it back anyway. All right. um, <laughs> well, you can, you, can, you can do it now if you want, or you can, uh, I, I take back my statements all the time. <laughs> no, what, what I said was that a financial crisis of that kind, of the kind we went through, uh, the probability of that occurring in our lifetime was, was nearly zero. And I think that's true doesn't mean it's zero. I said nearly zero. And I said that kind of financial crisis. Um, the last time we had one of these was 1935, and I'm probably not going to live for another 68 years. So, of course, some wags then had pictures of me dying, you know, next week, and, uh, which I thought was a little unkind. Um, sure your mother wasn't happy. Yeah, mother wasn't. She's not expecting me to pre-decease her, that's for sure. Um, so, you know, and, and the reasons are, um, you know, it's not just a flippant, off the cuff, it's, it's based in, there is some logic behind it. Um, the, the prop, what caused the financial crisis was um, a series of uh, institutions that took, a, in my opinion, took a level of credit risk, um, which if they were sufficiently wrong, would wipe out their equity capital. Investors, people who were doing business with them, as it began unfolding, panicked about it and said, well, if your capital's wiped out, you go into bankruptcy or you disappear, what's happened to my money that's sitting inside your institution? I want my money. And what we got to see was the Jimmy Stewart film, It's a Wonderful Life. Everybody's going to the bank saying, I want my money, because I'd seen you're doing all this risky stuff that might go bad, and my money's going to get trapped. And, you know, like in the Jimmy Stewart film, when he's trying to explain, well, I'm, you know, Mrs. Jones, your money's helping Mr. Brown pay for his house, she says, that's all well and good. I want my money. And that's called a liquidity crisis. So it was a fundamental lack of confidence around credit which drove a liquidity run and eventually you just run out of money. So the question is, how long does the crisis come, go on for and how long do you have a liquidity crunch? And the way 
the firms, the banks around the world were financed in those days, they generally had, you know, as few as two weeks to four, six weeks of liquidity. So if this went on for two to four, six weeks, they were gone. It didn't matter how good the business was, they'd have to shut. So, because they couldn't fund themselves. And indeed, a number of them closed. We now, and Wall Street, broadly defined, the commercial banks in the world, liquidity profile is dramatically different. We could fund ourselves for a year. And we have double the capital. And if things did go bad, the government under Dodd-Frank has um, implemented uh, two processes, one called an orderly liquidation authority, which means if they see bad things happening, you're being a reckless management, we're going to unwind you institution. They can just sell off your pieces and unwind you. Or uh, there's something called a resolution where you get put into effective bankruptcy. So there are, firstly, I would argue there is a cultural shift, which will not be permanent for sure. But secondly, the structural changes of liquidity and capital are demonstrable at a level which is truly underappreciated in the general public domain. And at the back end, the resolution and orderly liquidation are real and are tools that were not available in the last crisis. Could all of that amount to naught? It could. Do I think that's likely to happen? No. And the point of what I was saying was I don't, and why I made that comment was, I don't think it is widely understood of how healthy our financial system is now. And that needs to be known because that drives the economy. That doesn't mean there isn't going to be some trader tomorrow do something stupid or some bank somewhere do something stupid. Individual institutions will always mess up. The system, though, is much healthier. And that's what I was trying to say. I should have been more elegant saying it. Well, you just explained it very well. So let me ask you back to those days, though. You joined uh, Morgan Stanley in 2006. Six. Six. Okay. So shortly thereafter, um, there's this crisis. And at one point, it was thought that Morgan Stanley and other firms might not survive. Do you think without the TARP money, Morgan Stanley could have survived? Well, that's, that's, a, um, that's an interesting question. What is, is not well known is the um, – I was actually in Washington when, uh, with my predecessor, John Mack, meeting with uh, the management of Mitsubishi Bank. Um, MUFG, their uh, CEO and president, at a little hotel in a back room here in Washington about three in the afternoon where all the lights were dark. It was like one of these mafia movies. And we agreed in that meeting that they would invest $10 billion in Morgan Stanley. On the way to the airport, um, John had a phone call from then Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson saying, I'd like you to come to Washington. He said, I'm actually just leaving. He said, well, I'd like you to come back tomorrow morning. And the next morning, we were given $10 billion. So we got 20. Um, I don't want to say it wasn't needed. What was necessary about TARP was it took the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of the US financial institutions, put them all in a room, and said, we're not going to tell you who's good, who's bad, and who's ugly. But we're going to tell you, you're all going to take a certain amount of money. Because if we single some out and not others, then it's going to create a problem. And after a little whimpering from a couple of them, and not us, I think John was very early to sign on, everybody took their money, and that was a great thing. And the banks, a fact that maybe everybody here knows, but I'll just give you a number that's worth knowing, TARP was $700 billion. Most people think the banks got $700 billion. The banking system got about $250 billion, and the banking system has paid back over $260 billion. In our case, we paid back uh, our money very quickly with a 20% return to taxpayers on an annualized basis, which is great. Taxpayers deserved it. They took some risk. They deserve a sporty return. So TARP worked. I mean, what those, <coughs> what Treasury Secretary Paulson, Chairman Bernanke, and Tim Geithner, uh, head of uh, the New York Fed at that point, did, I think was gutsy and right, and it worked. Well, one more question on the past, because when Mitsubishi agreed to invest, your stock <coughs> was higher than it later turned out to be. At one point, they were putting in that money when your stock was roughly one-third of the price that it had been when they agreed to do it. So were you worried that they were going to say we're paying too much for something that is now trading at, let's say, one-third of what it was? I think they, like good investors, were able to see through the, um, the dust and the storm. And their investment decision was based upon a fundamental belief that Japan has gone through an extraordinary economic rebalancing where essentially it's created excess deposits because people live a lot longer and aren't spending and they're great savers and they don't have a lot of asset growth. 
and we're an asset genera generating firm. So the investment was strategic. What most people mistakenly think is Mitsubishi woke up one morning in the crisis and said, wow, that's a great opportunity. Let's go and put $10 billion in Morgan Stanley. That's not true. They've been thinking about this for 20 years. And it just happened the door opened on that day. And when the door opens, you walk through it. If you have strategic intent, you've got to follow through. So they were less focused on the actual pricing of the security on that day and whether they could have got a better deal or not than they were on um, what their ultimate strategic partnership is, which has been phenomenal. By the way, they didn't buy common equity at that point. They bought a preferred security, which paid them a 10% dividend, like Mr. Buffett had a dividend. So, you know, it wasn't, a, it wasn't such a bad investment to get a nice, sporty 10% dividend. So today, you mentioned the Dodd-Frank legislation. You said it has some pluses, but what do you think about the Volcker rule? Will we live long enough to see it? And uh, do you think it's a plus? Will we live long enough to read it? Right. It's, it's already... <laughs> <laughs> it's long. Um, I, firstly, I've, I've had the pleasure of um, uh, meeting with Mr. Volcker a number of times, including privately, and I think, you know, he's a great patriot. I think he's done a phenomenal job for this country um, as chairman of the Fed and then more recently. Um, but my v solution on this was a little different. I think the way to manage businesses as a regulator is to turn the dials, if you will, on capital, liquidity, and leverage. In other words, say, all right, you want to be in that business, we're going to require you to keep $3 of capital, whereas if you're in this business, it's $1 of capital. If you want to be in this business, we're going to require you to have 20% of your balance sheet liquid in this business, 10%, and so on, and turn the dials up or down depending on the business. So you as a business person look out and you go to your board and you say, gee, we want to be in these businesses that are more risky, the regulators require us to have a lot more capital to do that. Do we think we can get a decent return? Probably not. Is it prudent? Probably not. We're not going to be in it. And that, because trying to manage things by defining what activities you can be in and not be in might look clever today, but several years from now, who knows how people redefine it. The reason the Volcker Rule has taken so long to crystallize is, what is a proprietary position? i give you an example. We hold billions of dollars of municipal bonds in our inventory because we have clients, hopefully all of you, calling up and want to buy a muni bond. And we have them in our inventory and we sell them to clients. Uh, we take gains on those bonds occasionally and sometimes losses. Is that, is that running a principal business or an agency business? Are we doing it for ourselves ultimately or because we've got clients? So I think it's much simpler not to try and tell people what businesses they can and can't be in and more just say, you want to be in that, we're going to make it, and make it as punitive as you want. Okay. So um, you're in Washington today, obviously, and suppose the president called you and said, come on over, I'd like to know what I should do about appointing a new chairman of the Fed. So <laughs> tell me what Wall Street thinks. Would you like to see me keep Mr. Bernanke? Would you like me, Ms. Janet Yellen? Anybody else? Do you have any views on what you would tell the president you might want to share with us about the Fed chairmanship? Well, as David, as you know, any conversation with the president is private, so I wouldn't be able to share that. Um, Does Wall Street have a view? Does Wall Street generally have a view on what the Fed president should do on that? I think there are a lot of individual views, and everybody has their personal favorites. Um, what I think is disappointing is when, and I don't know if you saw David uh, uh, Gergen, um, wrote a piece uh, last night, it might have been an online piece, but ab about uh, the appointment process. And he pointed out this might be the second most important job in the country right now. And in many countries, it's the most important job in the country um, for periods of time. And, you know, it'd be awfully nice for it to be, you know, it's like in Lady Macbeth, if it were done well, then to be well done quickly, get this thing done and get it done privately. I don't think it's constructive for the public debate around such an important role as chairman of the Federal Reserve. And, um, you know, I hope that they come to a speedy resolution. They're obviously, you know, Larry Summers and Janet Yellen and several others are extraordinarily qualified people. Um, whether one of them more has a bias towards continuing or not continuing quantitative easing, you know, people change their views and change their approaches. So. So, all right, well, whoever the, gets the, the position will presumably have to do some tapering of quantitative easing. Mm. Are you uh, worried, as uh, a major official on Wall Street, that tapering will disrupt the economy or will have market dislocations, or what do you think will be the impact? I think it's great. And here's the reason, because it's a sign the economy is recovering. The reason that the government can cut back 
is because the engine has enough muscle itself, it doesn't need this artificial help. Um, so we should all look forward to the day when tapering comes. And, you know, Wall Street's going to go a little nuts when they start tapering because everybody's trying to time it perfectly. I think Chairman Bernanke said when unemployment hits 6.5%. Well, does he mean actually the day it hits? Does he mean three quarters of that? Does he mean on a trend line towards it? Everybody's trying to be too clever figuring it out. My attitude is forget about that. The important thing is people are getting back to work. That's a great answer. And if that means the government's pulling back from the, from the easing, then that's a, that's a necessary step to get the whole machine going. If it means Wall Street's in a state of uh, disrepair for a few weeks, then that's our problem. Is Wall Street, let's say, uh, not worried about that as much? Are you worried about the uh, debt limit? Um, we don't have a debt limit agree agreement in the United States right now, and we could default on our debt. Is Wall Street worried about it? Or are you worried about it? It's, it's like one of these things that's kind of always, it's like a permanent headache. You know, it just won't go away, but it's not disabling. You still go to work every day. Um, you know, eventually the political community gets to the right place. It's, it's pretty clear that uh, the U.S. needs to address uh, the debt issue. There's been the Fix the Deficit group, which I think has been very constructive, and other groups that have tried to help. I just, you know, really hope and pray that our political community can come to a middle ground. It's, it's not like one side is going to wake up one morning and say, you know what, the other guys were right all this time. So that's not going to happen. So... Therefore, there are two other outcomes. They come to a middle ground or they do nothing. And the longer we do nothing, the more it just capitalizes interest and, and, and hurts future generations of Americans who didn't deserve this. I mean, they don't deserve this great burden. And I don't understand why folks can't be rational and accept in any significant debate there has to be some give and take in it. And I thought the Simpson-Bowles Commission laid out whether it was the right answer, it was a very plausible set of doable things which would have taken a little bit from both sides and unfortunately didn't go through. So let's assume that eventually the debt deal was worked out, but what would you say Morgan Stanley thinks or you think is likely to be the GDP growth of the United States next year or so? you see any risk of a recession? We'll grow at 2.5%. What would you say is likely to be uh, the growth rate or the state of the economy in the United States? I, I'm, I'm uh, much more bullish than most people in the U.S., I think it's probably, um, if you had to make a risk return trade-off of investing somewhere in the world, I'd invest in the U.S. right now. And I don't think you've been able to say that for 30 or 40 years. There are still emerging markets that are growing faster. China's growing at, you know, 6 or 7 percent. Um, but I think on a risk return basis, um, you'd have to look at the U.S. as being... And, and the reasons of, you know, the, we have uh, great immigration. We have continued great mobility. We have a clean healthy banking system, we have corporate balance sheets that are clean, we have consumers who have delivered um, their personal debt, we have 401k plans are up 12% last year, probably that much this year. Every dollar that's going to the housing market is in almost every part of this country is a dollar of equity to the homeowner. These are great things. And there is no irrational exuberance in the market. Um, so I think the U.S. is um, in, in really strong fundamental shape. Whether that translates into two, two and a half, three, three and a half percent, I don't, you know, I'm not an economist, I don't know, but I, I'm just bullish on the U.S. and I think we should celebrate a little bit the fact that this country is coming back. Now, there are problems. There are still kids coming out of colleges who can't get jobs. The minimum wage in this country is very low for a lot of working families to raise a family with. Um, we have parts of the country that are still not recovered from you know, their own mini recessions, regional recessions. So there are problems. I'm not being Pollyannish, but, but relative to the rest of the world and relative to where we were, we're in a much more stable place. So now it's a question of the slope of the gradient. We're going to grow like this or grow like that. The question isn't, I don't think it's recession. Okay. So um, people might be watching this on television or here today, and you're the head of Morgan Stanley, one of the biggest money managers in the world. So they might want to know, Leaving aside the Morgan Stanley stock that you presumably own, what do you do with your money? I mean, where, where, do, you, where do you put in equities, fixed income? Can you give any advice about what me, people me should do? personally? Yes. What do you do with your money? Where is your money? People will say, wow. you're the head of Morgan Stanley. Where is your money invested? Where should they put their money? Okay. I, I, other than Morgan Stanley stock. I assume Morgan Stanley stock is... Uh, is your, your biggest investment, I assume, but it's one of your biggest ones. I, I'll, tell you I'll tell you exactly what we do. 
And my wife and I uh, actually just met with our financial advisor on Friday. Who's a Morgan Stanley? Who, who is Morgan Stanley, private wealth advisor. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have her phone number if any of you would like right. to meet with her. Very talented young lady uh, and her team. Uh, we, we're, we're pretty boring, um, partly because of the job I'm in and partly because I think in life and in business, um, it behooves you to take catastrophic risk off the table. Once you take catastrophic risk off the table, you can do a lot of other things besides. So we invest in municipal bonds to ensure we have catastrophic risk off the table and have a cash flow if, God forbid, the world falls apart. Um, and obviously, I, I hold the Morgan Stanley stock. And we invest in one very small biotech fund with somebody who I respect deeply and has done a phenomenal job. And then with our kids' accounts, we invest globally with equities, distributed all over the world, because hopefully they'll live a long time and the rest of the world will bounce back and that'll be good for them. So we're very modest and very unspectacular. I think you have enough private equity in your portfolio or <laughs> not? Uh, yeah. I, guess, I guess you can never have enough private equity in my view, but okay. All right. So why should somebody have, uh, well, here's a chance for you to, to talk to people here and, and maybe help Morgan Stanley. Um, why should somebody have their money managed by Morgan Stanley? You have enormous number of brokers. You manage uh, enormous amounts of money, uh, uh, I guess maybe a trillion dollars or close to that. Why should somebody have their money managed by Morgan Stanley? I assume you're very good at managing money, but what would be the best reason? Well, we, we, um, uh, we manage a trillion eight, uh, which makes us, depending how you count it, you know, number one or two in the world in size. Um, and uh, we manage money for about three million households in this country and, and a bunch overseas. Uh, I think what you, what you want is um, uh, two things. One, you want to know that the institution cares about what you, the business you're doing with them, whatever that business might be, whether it's getting a mortgage or investing or um, as a corporation uh, borrowing. And, and our institution only participates in the advising, the managing, the distributing and trading of capital. That's what we do. So we do it for governments, we do it for corporations, and we do it for individuals, we do it for foundations, we do it for universities, we do it for not-for-profits. But that's all we do. So there's an intensity of focus around what we do and what our clients need. So that's a good thing. Second thing is, is the institution stable? Does it have good values? Will it do the right thing? And does it have the resources to apply a level of intellectual capital to my problems as an investor, whatever they might be, whether it's somebody who wants to invest in private equity or somebody who wants to invest in municipal bonds. And unambiguously, we have that because we're, uh, that's what we do. And, and then, so that's the first part, and I think you could check that box comfortably with Morgan Stanley. The second part then is, so who's going to help me? Who's going to pick up the phone? Who am I going to work with? And uh, then it's a lot around the capability of the team, the structure of the team, but also personal chemistry. And uh, my wife and I, um, uh, in the time when we had to find a financial advisor, I asked to meet with three or four different teams. So, and I think it's like anything. It's, it's hopefully you do this when you find a, a new doctor you've got to go and find. You, you go and meet with two or three or four different doctors and find out who you think relates well to you, understands you at a level you're comfortable with and has the energy to work with you in the way you want them to. And from that, you sort out and you find. So everybody, I, I had a, one of the top CEOs in the country call me the other day whose advisor had retired, and he asked me for a recommendation. I said, I'm not going to give you a recommendation. He said, well, why not? You've got 17,000 people. I said, because I'm going to give you four or five people on paper to think about. I recommend you talk to three of them, and then I suggest you and your wife decide. Okay. And, that's, and that's what he's going to do. Um, but th it's the chemistry and the, the capability of the team with the credibility and the resources of the institution. What is the greatest pleasure you get out of running Morgan Stanley, and what's the biggest headache? I, other than this interview, I guess, would be the... <laughs> um, the greatest pleasure, I think, is being given the privilege to take an institution that's had some pretty dark times, as most of the big banks did in the crisis, and restore it to the kind of institution that it was for most of its 76 years and for what it was revered for. And to have the privilege to do that and to take the decisions 
that when you're making the decisions that get you on that path, you're always criticized, as you know, in any public eye position, doesn't matter who you are, you're being criticized continuously. And, and having in your, your, your gut and your heart a confidence that we're making the right decisions and everybody else is going to figure it out eventually, which is, sounds arrogant, but it's a balance between confidence that you, you've got a plan and you're going to push on that plan and then getting the employees excited behind that plan. That's the, the positive. The, the headache of it, you know, I, there really isn't one. I mean, I'm a very lucky person. I grew up in a huge family in Melbourne, Australia, and um, almost by accident I applied to business school because I wanted to just expand from being a lawyer. I didn't think I was a very good lawyer. I was the sixth lawyer in my family, and I was the least talented of all of them. They pretty much kicked me out. And, you know, and here you are running a place like Morgan Stanley. It's a great honor. I'm, you know, if I'm complaining about this, you know, occasionally we'll come home and I'll be sitting with my wife and she'll remind me that, you know, I'm in Washington these three days and then on Sunday morning I'm flying to uh, uh, Abu Dhabi and then I'm in uh, Qatar and Dubai in the next day and then I'm flying to uh, Budapest and then to Essen and Frankfurt and then to London. I'm flying home on Thursday night. And she'll say, you know, this is too hard. How is this possible? Why are you doing this? And I say, because I choose to. And you think this is hard? How hard it would be if I didn't have a job? <laughs> and I'm coming home and we're sitting here all day talking together. <laughs> so she says, get to Essen. Well, on that happy note, um, <laughs> let me thank you very much for a very informative and interesting interview. Let me give you a gift. Hold on. a map of the District of Columbia, the first map of the District of Columbia. Thank you. Thank you.